It's really good to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm supposed to be speaking about how you sell into Africa. And, and that's a really broad topic to try and cover, and I'm not sure I'm the most qualified person to do this. I've been running this business called Conga for uh, about two and a half years now. It's been um, a bit of a, a PhD, if you like, in e-commerce. I'm not through with it yet. I'm not sure that it ever ends. But I, I've learned a lot along the way, and I'll try and share that with you in as entertaining a way as possible. So Conga started in June um, 2012. Um, very few people. We had no idea what we were doing. We kind of just you know, jumped into this thing called online retail. And we started selling stuff to Nigerians. And it was exciting from day one because within sort of 10 minutes of the launch of the site, um, we got our first order. Um, it was for lipstick. And we, we, we got the order wrong. We picked the wrong color. Um, <laughs> And um, we were still very excited about it. And uh, fortunately, things have gone a bit better since then. But the business has learned and morphed and changed a lot. Um, I personally have learned a lot about e-commerce, about the different flavor of e-commerce, retail, marketplaces, um, what one country needs and what another, what another region needs, how regions differ. And actually, I must say, this is one of the things that makes me hesitate about saying Conga is the Amazon of Africa or is the Alibaba of Africa. I think, if you, I think those things really belie sort of what is really happening with e-commerce around the world. So fish are fish. Marine animals are marine animals. They all have fins and they all generally look the same. But a hammerhead shark is very different from a sperm whale. And I think it's the same thing that's going to happen in e-commerce. They'll have different monetization models. They'll look very different. And so calling one company the fill in the blank of this region I think can be tricky sometimes. And Conga is doing that as we've evolved. We started out selling stuff. We bought stuff, put it in a warehouse, and shipped stuff. And at some point, even spiritually, internally, I felt like this was not what Africa needed, almost instinctively. And as I started to see the business grow and develop, and it was exploding and growing, I knew that there was a, sort of a higher cause, if you like, which is to help Africans sell stuff. So Conga has morphed in the past year from a, being a business that does e-commerce to being a business that helps African businesses do e-commerce. Uh, and this is really where we're going, and it's a future we're really excited about. Um, do I just go next slide if I? OK. So people like growth graphs. Thank you. So I, I'm obliged to show you a growth graph. Um, that's a growth graph. <laughs> and uh, you know, we, uh, we've had our, our business plan revised um, about four times now. And every time we revise the business plan, we exceed the business plan. So we've got investors that I hope are happy. Um, and, but you see a particular sort of lurch in, in, in July. Things really start to take off. And that's the point where we go from being a business that is sort of trying to be this monolithic company that kills all the small and medium-sized businesses in Nigeria to being a business that helps SMEs and even brands in places like the Western Cape sell into Nigeria. Uh, and we think this is what we're really here to do, is to be an operating system for commerce, not necessarily the one that does everything. Africa has already has enough stuff, has enough drivers that buy vehicles and enough traders that have merchandise. What Africa needs is an operating system that kind of coordinates everything, an orchestra conductor that gets all the violins and, and the cellos and everything playing together. And that's what we're trying to, to do. And we have an office now in, in um, Century City with 20 of the most talented engineers um, from around the Cape Town area, working towards making this vision happen, working with 80 engineers in Nigeria, the largest engineering team in Nigeria, um, driving this growth. Uh, January was particularly surprising because it came in higher than December, which is we didn't expect. So no numbers, but it's growing anyway. So let's just um, let's go on. So here we are in this lovely city. I'm clicking and nothing is happening. A point, ah, there you go, okay. I love the Western Cape. Um, I think it occupies a special part in this continent. You guys are really lucky to live here. And so when these guys invited me to come here and give this chat and get out of Lagos's pollution for a few days, I jumped at the chance. Um, it's a wonderful part of the continent. It's beautiful, of course, intoxicating almost. The lavender and, and the vine in the air as you go to Franschuk, all of that. It's wonderful, special part of Africa, but also filled with men of great ambition, right? And that's why we're all here. We're trying to figure out 
how to sell into Africa. You all share that ambition. And some that, sometimes that ambition takes an ugly dimension, like in the movie Blood Diamonds. But sometimes it's great ambition. Great companies have come out of here. Sanlam, Woolworths, ShopRite, of course, Naspers. Incredible companies have come out of here. Um, those stories are still being told, but one story I think has already been told that would help us, I think, understand how to address Africa. And that is the story of Cecil Rhodes. So you guys are gasping now. <laughs> so, you know, probably isn't a more controversial um, individual in the history of Africa as, as, this, as this man. But to remove him from our history would be like taking George Washington out of United States' history. A very complicated fellow. Um, I don't think there's one person in the history of Africa that's uniformly not liked from kings of Botswana to the Boers who laid siege to Kimberley. And nobody likes this guy, it seems. So Cecil Rhodes didn't do Africa nicely, but he did Africa effectively. And I think as you think about going into Africa, there are some things that um, he, he, you can learn from him if you can put aside sort of any dis distaste you may have for him. Um, so what can we learn from Cecil? First is to think long term. And these are all lessons I'm, lessons I'm trying to imbibe even right now. The second is to be open to partnerships. You can't do Africa alone. The third is to prioritize, prioritize. And the fourth is to localize. So let's kind of see how Cecil did all of these things and see what we can learn from, from him. So the first is to think long term. So at the, at the time that he died, he was one of the wealthiest men in the world. And it seemed like it happened at night. But he focused on Kimberley alone, which turned out one the most lucrative diamond um, mining areas in the world for 17 years, pulling people together. There's this notion that Africa happens very, very quickly. It doesn't. That's not the case at all. And he had these long-term goals, these amazing long-term goals. At the point where he died, he was still talking about building a railway line from the Cape to Cairo and a telegraph line from the Cape to Cairo. And, and it's something that I've learned to do. I would very much like to move to Constantia or Bishop's Court someday, but I know that this journey that we're on this conga journey is going to take a long time. And I think, you know, whether it's e-commerce or traditional retail, this is the story. It, it takes a while. So as you think about building your brands, taking your business into Africa, you have to remember some things. The first is Africa takes time. It's a baobab. My mother used to tell me, you know what, what you want to do is grow baobabs. You don't want to grow a banana tree. A banana tree grows very quickly in a year or two, but when the winds come, banana tree bl blows over. It takes a while to develop brands. It takes a while to develop distribution networks. It takes a while to do multi-country strategy. You can't go multiple countries at the same time. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Oh, can I just go back? OK. So manufacturing is rising in Africa. I see it happening. There are FMCGs, consumer brands, lipstick, things being manufactured in Nigeria, car assembly. Nissan is now being assemble, uh, assembled in Nigeria. The manufacturing base is increasing. The infrastructure is improving. I used to live in South Africa. I moved out back to Nigeria in 2006. Spent two years here after the States, and then moved back to Nigeria. And the roads of Lagos, any of you that has been to Lagos from 2006 to now will know Lagos is improving. But there's still a lot more work to do. My wife is from Senegal. You go to Senegal, you can see that Senegal is following Nigeria. These are not things that happen, you know, you don't deploy roads as quickly as you deploy servers. So we in this field call e-commerce because we have a tendency to be Usain Bolt. We run fast. We think everything happens fast. Everything happens at one gigabit per second. We expect that the contextual environment around us will move at the same speed, and it's not true. Things take time in Africa. And you try and run too fast, too far in Africa, you tend to fly off cliffs. Brand building is fast, but you find that the context is slow. So you have to take your time. And you have to be consistent over that long run so you don't burn out. It truly is a marathon. Now, it's not an easy marathon because there's a lot of work to do in the interim. There's infrastructure to be built, like Luke was referring to. There's heavy lifting to be done. You know, it's funny, when, when, um, you know, when I was um, uh, speaking to in a board meeting for Conga, and one, one um, investor of Conga says, you know, you need to run fast. You need to move really quickly. It's a marathon. You know, you need to run very quickly. I said, okay, great, it's a marathon. It's, sorry, it's a sprint. You need to run quickly. I said, okay, great, it's a sprint. And then same board meeting, another investor says, you know, you, this thing is long term. You need, it's a marathon. And I said, come on, is this a marathon or a sprint? And then one of them goes, it's a marathon of sprints. And you're like, oh, Jesus Christ. So it's a marathon of sprints. It's long term. Um, what else did Cecil do? He was open to partnerships. 
Now, people say Cecil Rhodes was imperialistic and he pushed the British agenda. I don't buy it. He was just a pragmatic businessman. He basically got a discount from the British Empire to secure his concessions. So as he marched into Kimberley or as he marched into present-day Botswana, he got the crown to protect him. Um, and that was a partnership he needed because there were a thousand other guys perhaps with similar ambition as he did. He did not try to do Africa alone. At the same time, he sealed deals with you know, folks in Europe that basically allowed him to create uh, a cartel, a monopoly of sorts on diamond supply chain. It's pretty good business. You may question the ethics, but it's really good business. Um, and Rhodes did make some mistakes. Let's be clear. He didn't do everything right. He, he basically effectively screwed the kings of Botswana. And when he did that, and Katanga in southern Congo, and when he did that, it never worked out well. Those concessions ended up unraveling. And in some cases, King Leopold of Belgium took over those concessions. What does that mean for you? As you go into Africa, you need those partnerships. Nobody can do Africa alone. You need your local distributors there if you own a brand, if you're retailing into Africa. This notion that you try and ship from here directly to Conga doesn't work. I'll tell you what, because there are no credit lines. Retailers like us and some of our competitors and other players in the field of, in Nigeria were already stretched. We're using our funding to build out infrastructure. And now I'm being told by a potential partner in Cape Town that you want me to buy outright. You don't want to take any risk. You don't want to do any credit terms. You don't want to deal with me on that basis. There's no collaboration. It doesn't work. You will find that you meet roadblocks as you start to go into Africa. You need to think about logistics. What cities do you want to go into first? Um, what are your service levels? How do you do warehousing? All of these things, I think even as Conga as a company, we're finding out we need partners to make these things happen. And again, going back to this notion of marketplace, we're finding that we can't carry everything alone. It simply isn't possible. Creating the Amazon experience in South Africa is possible because you look outside, there's a water fountain, there are great roads, and it works. And ESCOM is load shedding, but I've been here two days now, and the electricity is stable. You can't simulate an Amazon experience on your own in Africa because it's Africa. It's incredibly difficult to do. You can't fund it alone. A great analogy I heard was e-commerce is like coming into a city and saying there are some roads in the city, but there are no zebra crossings, no traffic lights, so I'm going to put the roads up and the signage and create order, right? This is what e-commerce, this is what Bezos did in, in the United States. Um, but what, if you try and replicate what Amazon did in the United States and Africa as the equivalent of coming and saying, yeah, here's a forest, we're going to clear the forest, then we're going to build the roads, then we're going to build the houses, and then we're going to build the traffic lights and the signage. And it's just too heavy for one person to do alone. You have to work with the environment you already have and then bring order to it. Let's just move on quickly. I know I don't have a lot of time. This is a really surprising example of partnerships that are emerging um, around Conga. Since we opened up this marketplace, we've seen amazing things happen. Um, you shouldn't discount this. This is true magic happening. Naira Land is a very um, popular forum in Nigeria. Um, Everybody goes there to talk about all kinds of stuff. If you want to understand who may actually win the elections on February 14th, you should really should read Naira Land. Um, but we came upon this thing somebody posted once. So what happens with Conga is if you're a seller on Conga today, we're creating a system very similar to what you guys call PostNet here in South Africa. You receive an order and you take it to a Conga drop-off point and you ship it. Two minutes. Jeez, wow. Okay, I'm going to speak really fast now. And you ship it. But basically what's happening is that people are creating these drop-off points on behalf of Conga. And this is an example of somebody saying, look, I can ship stuff for you through to Conga, and here's how much you pay. I don't have a lot of time, I'm going to fly through. This is an example of Conga's logistics network. The point is, half of these logistics networks now that we're creating are not us. We're not buying the vans. We're not buying those vehicles and bikes. We're getting women in states outside of Lagos coming and saying, I'll buy the van, I'll buy the vehicles, you send me the orders. We're not carrying everything alone. We're not having to buy a fleet of thousands and thousands of vehicles. Next, prioritize. Rhodes didn't go to Botswana to begin with. He started at Kimberley. It's a big hole in Kimberley. You guys are probably familiar with the big hole. The largest you know, man-made dog hole that uh, produced the star of Africa Diamond. Um, he started there and focused there for a while before he went on. This graph is really important if you'll indulge me. Nigeria is super critical. Africa seems like, oh, great, let's go to Africa. But if you look at it, the middle class in Nigeria is 23 million people, right? Even more than the middle class of South Africa. But you go open up in Kenya, what, do you, what, do you, what are you doing? Two million people in Kenya. 
So you really need to prioritize. You look at the upper class. South Africa beats Nigeria out there, but you're talking about 100,000 people in Kenya. You really need to prioritize as you go into some of these markets. One African country is not equal to the other. There are no medals being in many African countries. Okay, so I'm gonna just blow past this. Finally, localize. Localize from the point of view of your products, localize from the point of view of your pricing. At the end of the day, Sisu was swallowed up in Africa. He's buried in Zimbabwe. Even Robert Mugabe wouldn't let them exhume Sisu's body. At the end, he was swallowed up in Africa, right? Because he became African. That's how you think about your brands. It's easy to sit here in the Western Cape and drink Shiraz and think, you know what? I'm gonna just port my products into Africa. It doesn't work. You need to think about localizing from the context of the product offering, from the con context of pricing, from the um, context of brand building and how you do all of those things. All of these brands are brands that Conga has created, partly out of necessity. We've talked to Ralph Lauren and Adidas and some of the larger brands around the world. Some of them work with us, but many of them don't. And they say, no, not Nigeria. And out of necessity, we created private labels. And guess what? They're doing amazing volumes. Great value for Africans at African prices. And finally, have ambition. Lots of ambition. And I just want to finish with this quote from Cecil Rhodes. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'll let you read To think of these stars that you see overhead at night, these vast worlds which we can never reach, I would annex the planets if I could. I often think of that. It makes me sad to see them so clear and yet so far. Leave Cape Town. Go into Africa. You want to do Africa? Go spend two weeks with us. Thank you. Uh, okay. So, okay.